Good morning. Uh, this is Warren Scheel, and today we're very fortunate to have um, Heidi DeFias, who's a family law attorney and mediator and collaborative attorney uh, practicing in Los Angeles, California. Thanks for coming on the show, Heidi. It's my pleasure, Warren. Heidi, tell us a bit about yourself and what you do. Well, um, in addition to being a family lawyer, a uh, certified family law specialist and mediator, in December of 2018, I received my master's in clinical psychology uh, with the hopes that it would help me in my uh, family law mediation practice uh, address the question that I came in with, which was how do I deal with all of these emotions that my clients are, are coming with? Um, so originally I was going to get the non-clinical masters because I thought, well, I don't have to, I don't have to be a therapist to find this out. And I found out that all the things that I was learning in the books, I, I was wanting to try in the room. And so I started pursuing my Mary uh, MFT, marriage and family therapist uh, license here in California. And you need 3000 hours for that. And I'm about halfway through. So in addition to my law practice, I am what we call a, a AMFT, an associate MFT, and I have a, a tiny practice of, um, of therapy clients as well, which include couples and individuals. So right now, I'm pretty busy, but what I love most is taking what I'm learning from the therapy practice and applying it to the mediation practice. And what's exciting is, is what is this whole topic of emotions. I don't know about you, but when I went to law school and when I, I learned dispute resolution as a lawyer, we were taught that emotions should be um, quieted and that they were irrelevant and that we should tell our clients to stop talking. And that was the extent of the intervention with emotions. And I've always felt like there could be more out there and so what I've been doing is trying to figure out what that more is and how it applies to a, a family law mediation practice. When people come to see me as a mediator, they're pretty clear they don't want to be in therapy. And I'm pretty clear we're not in therapy. But that doesn't mean that the use of emotions, the exploration of emotions doesn't help us. In fact, it does help us to come to um, decisions and understandings uh, in a much richer way. I agree. I mean, uh, uh, one of the, uh, I went uh, to, I was at Oxford in, in the UK. That's where I got my um, law degree. And then I practiced in New York and then I started practicing in California. And one of the things that struck me about doing family law um, is uh, really the lack of training for family lawyers in, in psychology, even taking the certified specialist exam. There was a mm -hmm. component. Uh, someone came in and talked about psychology but, but by and large, as family lawyers, we don't have that kind of training. And to, a good analogy would, would be with uh, doctors. Um, yeah. it's, uh, my understanding is it's only un recently that the, the, the doctors have been specifically trained on how to relate to patients and bedside manner and so on and so forth. Um, yes. That's something in, lacking in, in legal education. Um, and I think it could be improved upon because I think the hardest as a family lawyer, you're, you've got, you're wearing so many hats. You've got to be um, a lawyer. You've got to be part psychologist, part accountant, you know, mm -hmm. and yeah. um, it's, a, it's a very challenging vocation. Um, but tell me, were you ever a litigator? Did you ever litigate cases before you did mediation? I did. I, I litigated for the first 25 years of my career. I'm now working on year 31, and um, um, I found it stressful, <laughs> as most litigators do, um, but I got a lot out of the, the litigation practice, and I especially find it helpful to be able to describe exactly what my clients face if they're not able, able to mediate. Um, I also think that there's a certain challenge to litigation. You know, I, I thought of it kind of as the, the ultimate um, video game because it's such there's so many things that are happening in the courtroom the problem was that this video game was the expense of, of real families and um and i felt that it was a, a much more destructive uh, process than than my mediation practice 
However, I also think that it's possible to help people go through litigation um, in, a, in a more um, humane way, a more client-centered way. Um, and there are lots of litigators that I do refer to, like yourself, who I feel give my clients a, a human experience, which is what they often need more than anything else. Could you explain the difference between, I know that you do collaborative law, and so what's the difference between doing a mediation and collaborative law? Is, is there a difference? There, there certainly is. And the, the interesting thing about collaborative law is it's kind of a newer kid on the block. Um, and, and collaborative law, in my opinion, has really brought a lot to the, uh, to the mediation practice as much as mediation has brought to collaborative law. So the heart of collaborative law is where the parties sign a stipulation that says they will not go to court with the two attorneys who are in the collaborative process with them. And the theory being that in a collaborative process, you kind of want to take court off the table. So you want uh, the lawyers uh, and the parties to be focusing on solutions as opposed to perhaps threats of, of litigation. So the stipulation is signed and in the event the parties do want to go to litigation, they need to find new attorneys. So that's kind of what distinguishes it, I think, um, in, in its most stark way. Um, the other difference between that and is that you have four participants. I think of, of uh, collaboration as a square, whereas I think of mediation as more of a triangle. So with mediation, you have the, the two parties and you have the mediator. And with a collaborative law, you have each attorney, uh, each client has an attorney and you have the two clients and, and everything proceeds in, in that format, as opposed to the triangle with the three of them, uh, all of the meetings usually occur uh, with, with the four, the two attorneys and the two clients. And the two attorneys are trained in collaboration, which includes mediation skills. So you'll find them employing, <clears throat> excuse me, the same tools that a mediator would apply, such as as looking at, at the interests of the parties as opposed to the positions. Um, would you like me to go into more detail about the difference between interests and positions? Uh, absolutely, absolutely. Okay, so, um, so what I think of as the heart of mediation is this idea that we're focusing on interests as opposed to positions. And interests are why you want what you want as opposed to what you want. Because if we, we find that if people yell at each other, I want this, I want this, they don't go as far as if they talk about why they want what they want. And kind of the, the classic mediation example is if the parties have an orange and they both want the whole orange. If we cut the orange in half, everybody gets half of what they want and half of what they don't want. But if we talk about the orange, we might find out that partner one wants the seeds and partner two wants the juice. And then we can divide the orange in a way where both parties get 100% of what they want. And we would have absolutely missed that opportunity if we started the conversation by saying, the law says you slice the, the orange in half. So that, that's a good issue you raise about these different styles of mediation. Because I've come across uh, a, st a term such as facilitative mediation, muscle me mediation, evaluative mediation and so clearly there's different styles of mediation but they all intended to get to a specific outcome which is that both parties can agree with the outcome and in in your example of the orange obviously they they there was a you know zero-sum game as it were because they both got what they wanted but i think in in a lot of cases the outcome is um both of them sort of walk away not quite happy but not angry I mean, there's, there's always some element of buyer's remorse, particularly in a financial situation where there's, you know, a house, there's a tangible issue. And so you either have to sell it or divide it or so what, what's your mediation style? How do you approach mediation? Well, that is a very good question. And um, I, I think that, um, that uh, what you're talking about is kind of, I think of as the, the left wing of mediation, right wing of mediation. And I think of the right wing of mediation being controlled by the lawyers and the left wing being controlled by the therapists. So sometimes lawyers call their style, I like muscle mediation you came up with, evaluative. 
they're going to evaluate what the law says and tell the parties what the law says. And, and, and the law sounds, uh, I guess there's a premise that the law is the, the right way to go. <laughs> yeah. On the way left wing, they're the transformational mediators. And they're the ones actually, the only I think on the, on the continuum, that their goal isn't necessarily to come to an agreement. Their goal is to have a process that is transformational to the parties and that may or may not include a result. So there's a whole part of mediation who say, if you're focusing on the end result, you're missing the game. The people that hire me want a result. They want an agreement. And so I tend to actually uh, use all of the tools provided in the middle. I think we call it facilitative mediation where we facilitate what the parties want. But what's really important to me is that the people involved, um, they decide what their values are and the basis for their agreement. That I don't impose that, the law doesn't impose that. Because I honestly feel that people know what's best for them. And sometimes the law legal result may be best and sometimes it may not be best. Sometimes the settlement is gonna be best and sometimes the settlement is not going to be best. There are some people that, that need to have a determination made by somebody else. I, I'd argue that that's a, a small part. So I've been fortunate in my life to be trained on the whole continuum. And it seems to me that different families need different things. And I really want them to define what they need. Um, and if they can't find it, I want to give them those options. So I'm definitely not an evaluative mediator. I'm definitely not a transformational mediator, but I do think that everything um, from here to there um, has a lot to offer the people that I work with. Do you ever find that you, you're going along in a mediation and the parties are amicable and they're working on uh, a framework and building on, on, on agreements and you get to a point at the end where you have an agreement that covers everything, custody, financial, property, support, and um, everybody's happy with that. And they've worked very hard on that and no lawyers have been involved. And then of course you have to say as a mediator that um, each party has the right or should consult with an independent counsel to review the draft mediation agreement. So they go off and, and their, their attorneys say, what have you done? <laughs> what have you done? If you went to court, you would do much better than this. Have you ever had that kind of situation? And how do you handle it? Well, I'll tell you that I work to avoid that situation from the minute I meet the participants. So I, I am an advocate for people understanding what California law says, because I don't think they can make informed decisions without having that understanding. Um, so during the course of the mediation, I am going to be educating them on what California family law says so that they are never going to go to an attorney and have a surprise. I tell them that I can give them legal information as a mediator, but not legal advice. And I won't give them legal advice, but I will tell them this is, this is where the law is gray. This is where the law is clear. This is what I think would happen if the law were applied to your situation. These are the risks involved. So, so my clients almost never get into that situation where they learn something new from the consulting attorney. And in fact, before I send them to the consulting attorney, I say, your lawyer is not going to like this part of this agreement. If you're going to be working with this lawyer, you're going to have to explain why you want this particular part of the agreement. Um, lots of people come to the mediation table very phobic about attorneys, figuring that attorneys make their money on conflict and they don't want to involve attorneys. Um, I, I like having attorneys involved because I think they help to make better agreements so long as they're educated about how to support a mediation process. It's, it's more of an art than you would think because you really, as a consulting attorney, which I also do, you really have to value the mediated settlement because that's why the people are, are seeing us. They want to make their own decisions. They want to come up with a settlement and sometimes they have to give up something for that. So I'm, what I'm hearing is that you are probably, your, your, your practice is slightly different to for example, a retired settlement judge. Um, there's a lot of um, organizations that employ um, family court judges who've retired from the family court system, and they set themselves up as settlement judges or mediators. And, and my understanding is um, 
that often their mediations or uh, VSCs, you know, voluntary settlement conferences, always have attorneys. There's always an attorney on both sides. Um, in your mediations, do you have people come in and they, they, look you, they look for you, but they don't have attorneys at that point? And you, you basically do everything. You, you help them come to an agreement. About half the people that I work with in my mediations have attorneys and half do not. Um, and there are actually quite a number of differences with this voluntary settlement conference and with the retired judge, which I believe has a very valuable role as well. Um, there are some people that really want to hear a judge's perspective. Um, and generally, those voluntary settlement conferences are long periods of time, four to eight to, to, to 15 hours I've been in some of those. Um, my mediations are generally two to three hours, and um, we do not generally have a written agreement that results at the end of our meeting. I'm wanting them to think about it and not sign it on the spot, especially if they don't have their own attorneys. Um, so the mediations that I would work on would have um, sessions, you know, between one and four generally two-hour sessions instead of a full day. And I would not be, um, generally speaking, it's my preference to be in the room with both of the people together. Whereas in the average voluntary settlement conference, you have uh, one partner and their lawyer in one room and the other partner and their lawyer in the other, and the mediator goes back and forth. And I, I have tried that, and that is part of, <clears throat> excuse me, some of my mediations, if the, the parties require or need that. But I find that the more time we spend together in the room, the more information the parties have. When I'm going back and forth, I have all the information, but I'm not the one making the decisions, so I want them to have all the information. So I try to do as much in the room together as possible. I know that the next question I'm going to ask you is one that's almost impossible to answer, which is why I'm going to ask you. Um, <laughs> but when you're doing a, uh, let's say a divorce, uh, a more c a complicated divorce where you've got children involved, you have maybe a business, um, some pensions, a house, um, it's a longer term marriage. So there's a lot of different types of issues. Um, can you, is there a range of how many sessions and how long a mediation would take you? Mediation actually takes between two and four sessions. There are some two or four two hour sessions. There are some situations where they really have an agreement already and, and it's a lot of drafting and not much dispute resolution. And then there are some where I see them for a long time over a protracted period of time because there's a complicated issue or because that's how they want it. Um, but really the average is gonna be between two and four of those, those two hour meetings. Do you ever bring in experts like forensic accountants or mental health experts? I do. I do. I, I bring in, I like to work with neutral forensic accountants. Um, this, this idea of uh, that collaborative law has of mental health professional coaches, each, each side, each party having their own attorney and their own mental health professional, um, I think is a, a wonderful model because I think that the, the, the coach model in a, in a, just, divorce or legal separation is it's really imperative to meeting all of the needs of the client. And that's another thing that we learned from collaborative law is it's a multidisciplinary approach. So, um, so I've brought in experts to, uh, to meet with children, um, to help with parenting issues, uh, real estate agents to talk about listing, uh, forensic accountants. And I, I really, I really value their input. I mean, I think one of the, my experience with mediation, and I don't do as much mediation as you do, um, is that um, the outcomes, particularly in the area of custody, um, are usually uh, better for both the parents and the children because there's less conflict and um, they feel that they're invested in the process. And also mediation allows them to kind of see it as a process where as the children get older, they can come back and sort of fine tune their agreement. Um, and it, it leads to better co-parenting um, outcomes generally. Um, what's your, your experience? And, and obviously you're, you're a psychologist, you know, you're a psychologist now. What, what's your experience with, with mediating parenting plans? And how do you think uh, they're, they're, they're better than if you go to court and fight over custody? 
Well, not only anecdotally are they better. I mean, there's just tons of research right now that people who have mediated agreements are more likely to adhere to the agreements they make. Um, they're more likely to be able to modify the agreement when necessary. Um, and we have all this research that says that children can survive almost anything in a divorce other than the conflict of their parents being brought into that conflict and having a loyalty conflict where they have to choose one parent over the other. And anything else we do is actually going to be okay for those children, what the research shows. So yes, that is absolutely my um, experience. And, and if, they, if the parents are able to work together, there's so much more they can offer their children because everybody has different schedules. If they're able to work together enough where, you know, mom is at work um, and dad is free and can be with the children and then it flips, I mean, you really can come up with some parenting plans that work for children and their parents. Do you have, do you have cases where you do the mediation, you come up with a plan, a parenting plan, and then you sort of see them over, you know, a period of years afterwards to fine tune the plan? I do and I, I prepare them for that because the children are going to change they're going to change and what I would optimally like to do is that in the negotiation in the mediation they learn how to figure these problems out for themselves and we talk about that what is going to happen when this changes or that changes or you have a conflict and one of the things that they can always do is, is come back to me so yes I've seen families grow up and um, and it's been a, 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 a really wonderful experience because it's, I mean, parents who live together making decisions about their children is complicated. Never mind parents who are in two different homes. So it's really inspiring to see what people come up with. How has um, this COVID pandemic uh, affected the cases that you've seen? And are more people now mediating because the courts are, uh, for many cases, either closed or there's going to be significant delays. Have you seen more people coming in to see you to get around the um, court system? I'm awfully busy, I'll tell you that much, um, which I'm grateful for. Um, then also there's a lot of, of, of issues regarding parenting that are, that are coming up that, that actually have always come up, these different values, right? So parents have different values. One is very religious, the other isn't. Uh, one believes that you should never have debt, the other believes that debt is okay. And now we've got a, a whole other set of issues and that is how, how compliant are you going to be with the social distancing? Um, how much of a threat is it? I mean, this is really going to our core values, the COVID issues, but they really are the same issues that we've been dealing with all along. What are we going to do when two parents living in the same house or different houses have different values? How are they going to raise one set of children? Well, how, how do you deal with that? Let's say uh, one parent is very compliant um, and they, the kids don't go out and they don't form their little pods or bubbles. They work, don't go to school. They're not seeing anyone else. They wear their face masks. They do all the things that the CDC tells them to. And the other parent, is like, yeah, it's not really um, that serious. Um, yeah, I'll wear a face mask, but you know what? We'll have kids over in the front garden. We're going to form little pods with families. I think we can go out to eat. I mean, that you, how, do you, how do you square that circle or make a circle of that square? Because I don't, is, there any, is there any common ground? This is, even though it's so stark and people believe that their children's lives are on the line with this decision, this is the same decision that we all face as co-parents every single day. And we have a limited number of choices, unfortunately. You know, we can do it my way, we can do it your way, we can compromise, we can have someone else decide, or we can live in chaos. Right? And the people that come to me, they say, living in chaos is not a possibility. Having it all my way is not a possibility. So I'm going to get it as much my way as possible because the alternative is worse. And that's what I think we all do when we have a value disagreement. We, we look at our options and we pick the thing that is, is least bad. Um, and this is a very tough one because this is really scary to some people and not as scary to others. So you have two people operating in very different realities. And again, that's what mediation is. Mediation is acknowledging the two realities, hoping that the two people involved will respect the reality of the other, 
and then coming up with not a shared reality, but a way to coexist. In, in some ways, it, you're, you're luckier because the people going to mediation are self-selecting in the first place. I imagine they're going to be the more reasonable type of parent because they selected to mediate their problem as opposed to fight it out. I mean, is that true? I'm not sure. I mean, the people that I work with have just as deeply held feelings and emotions. They're just analyzing the best and worst case scenario a little differently. I mean, people who don't come to me say the, the best, the worst case scenario, I'm, I can live with someone else making the decision for us. People come to me say, I can't live with someone else making the decision for us for a lot of reasons, whether it's cost or loss of control. But sometimes people start mediation and it turns out that they would rather have someone make the decision. I mean, it, it's, it's sad because the, the world of possibilities are not what our clients want. You know, they want us to come in and say, we can do it exactly the way you think. And we don't have a system to offer that and mediation certainly doesn't offer that. Um, but I think what mediation does offer is maybe the opportunity to, to grieve that. I'm not going to get what I want. I'm not going to get the childhood for my kid that I want 100%. But I would argue that's true for all of us. Um, you know, whether you, whether you grow up with uh, your parents in one home or in two homes, we, it's a, a, a compromise. Parenting is a compromise, which makes it beautiful and horrible at the same time. I'm going to take a pause for one second. I'll be right back. Let me just pause this. Um, no, I can't pause it. So I'm going to keep going. <laughs> so you learn something every day with uh, Zoom, right? Um, you certainly do. I've got to, I've got to say that, that the, um, I think the legal community has gotten, picked up Zoom very quickly and, and did quite well with Zoom. Um, um, I just went to pick up uh, the school books for my kids. And mm -hmm. um, I think some of the schools are not, are not doing, uh, particularly the LAU, LAUSD, are not doing as well yeah. um, what a with the technology, which is unfortunate. Um, I want to ask you a bit about your psychology background because um, I, I'm not aware of, I think there's one other judge who's sitting on the family court who has a psychology degree. So you're almost in a unique situation as a lawyer, a family lawyer, and a psychologist. How do you think your psychology background is helping your practice? Well, the Board of Behavioral Services um, would want me to clarify that I am a therapist and not a psychologist. Okay. But I, I think that, um, you know, most of the people that I, I ha encountered who were lawyers getting their psychology degree um, were fleeing law altogether. And so there's, I think, a fair number of us lawyers who are becoming a therapist, but none of us are staying in law. And that's what I think makes me a little bit uh, uh, unique in that way. Um, in, in terms of informing my practice, um, I'm learning how to deal with people who are highly emotional, which used to scare me as a, a non-therapist mediator. I didn't want to ask things or do things that would make people cry or yell. And I feel much more comfortable with that now. And I'll, I'll tell you why. The reason is that as a lawyer, I think we're um, programmed to believe that we fix things. Lawyers fix things. Therapists know that they can't fix things, that only the client can fix things, and that the therapist can do certain things that might help them fix themselves. And those certain things are very basic. Uh, for when somebody feels heard, that goes a long way. When somebody doesn't feel so alone, when somebody feels validated, when somebody doesn't feel so scared. And so um, there's also in the room, you know, there's a lot of brain science that we have right now that, that shows that when we get activated, when our amygdala gets activated, um, we're not really all that capable of having a rational, logical conversation. So if I've got two people yelling at each other in the room, there's no way we're going to talk about the community contribution to a separate asset. So um, I don't try to pull, push through those anymore. I say, we got to take a break. We got to figure this out because your right brain, your emotional brain has taken over from your left brain. Till the left brain gets back on, we're not going to make any progress. 
And so just that understanding of the psychology of brain science has helped me in the room with emotions. Good. Uh, I have now figured out to pause the recording. And, and when we come <laughs> back from our break, um, we're going to talk a little about, a bit about prenups and postnups because uh, we work together on, on a few of those. Here we go. I'd be delighted. Okay, we're back on the air after taking a commercial break. <laughs> <laughs> I, I want to. I want to say this program is sponsored by, but it's not. So, and, <laughs> not and it will never. <laughs> um, so we we've worked together on some cases, and we in particular we've done uh, prenuptial agreements. Uh, and I've had it's been a, a great experience uh, doing a prenuptial agreement with you, uh, because you we you put into I've seen how your practice works, which is. Uh, is very amicable um, you know both parties come in it's taken the last one we did I think was like two sessions uh -huh. and uh, both parties were in the sessions as we were doing the, 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 the prenuptial agreement and as we were going along we were informing them about their options so both felt educated and it, both both of them I think felt that we weren't you know pulling one on the other um, and they, they realized what they were doing, particularly in terms of sort of departing from California law. Because one of the things you said earlier was that what California law is, um, isn't necessarily what the parties want, particularly when it comes to things like spousal support. Mm -hmm. um, in, in, if you live in California, I think that we have very generous provisions for spousal support. And uh, a lot of people don't think that's fair. Uh huh. So, um, you in your practice, you do both prenuptial agreements and also postnuptial agreements. That's right. Um, can you explain the difference? Because not many attorneys do postnuptial agreements. A lot do prenups, but not postnups. Right. So the difference between a prenuptial agreement and a postnuptial agreement is kind of twofold. The prenuptial agreement is executed before the people get married and the postnuptial agreement is executed after the people get married. That's the first difference. The second difference is that there's a very different uh, legal standard for what duty, what legal duty the parties owe each other before they get married and after they get married. So in California, we have these fiduciary duties. And the fiduciary duty is the highest duty of good faith and fair dealing that two people or entities can owe each other. So in the business world, um, where there are uh, collaborators, those collaborators uh, often cannot uh, do something that will financially prejudice the other. And um, about halfway through my career, good 10 years into my career, California law said that people who are married owe each other fiduciary duties as opposed to the duty of good faith. And the fiduciary duty is a really high duty. And so the thought about the prenup versus the postnup is with the prenuptial agreement, you have people that do not owe each other fiduciary duties. And with the postnuptial agreement, you have people who do owe each other fiduciary duties. So if you're going to agree to something that is going to benefit one party more than the other, and you want that agreement to be enforceable, you're going to want to do it before the parties get married. And in fact, there's some people who argue that there are no prejudicial or beneficial things that people should be able to agree to after marriage because such an agreement would breach the fiduciary duty. So this, there's a theory among lawyers that the postnuptial agreement is likelier to be uh, invalidated than the prenuptial agreement and that makes lawyers uncomfortable and so some of them do not do the postnuptial agreements and some don't do the prenuptial agreements either well i mean i think, I think it's fair to say that I, I i haven't found many attorneys that do postnuptial agreements for a number of reasons just like you said um mm -hmm. and that if there's a a, a, a postnuptial agreement um, particularly where there's a transfer, we call it a transmutation of mm -hmm. property from one spouse to the other. Um, it is actually presumptively unfair if one spouse gains an advantage. So you have to like rebut that presumption. Um, also, you know, uh, with, with a prenup, you have an entire framework. You have the family code, 
which That's says right. that if you comply with those formalities, That's as exactly long right. as the, um, the prenuptial is, is not unconscionable, and of course, nowhere is the, the phrase unconscionable defined, then it's gonna, gonna be valid. Um, do, you, do, you, uh, do you work with uh, other attorneys doing postnuptial agreements? I do. I mean, I, I think that each attorney has to decide for him or herself the balance between uh, liability and the types of services they want to provide. Um, and also, it's the type of, of postnuptial agreement. If I had a postnuptial agreement where, um, you know, um, uh, it was very unfair or something like that, um, regardless of whether it was a prenuptial agreement or a postnuptial agreement, I would also have the choice of deciding whether I wanted to participate in it. It seems to me that it's awfully hard to be married and having somebody else's rules imposed on you when you don't want them to be um, is, is something that I don't think is necessary and I want to be a part of giving people other options. Is there a particular kind of case that you like handling in your practice? Um, do, you, do you veer to more towards custodial type cases? or do you do handle both custody cases and financial cases? And is there uh, a size limit or is there a particular sweet spot for you in your practice? No, I'm pretty much all over the map. I, I don't prefer parenting over finances. They both kind of offer such different skill sets that I enjoy. I do love the, um, the prenuptial and the postnuptial agreement because I think relationships are so fascinating. Um, and also the law integrated into those relationships is, is fascinating. Um, you know, what makes people get married? What makes people separate? What makes people enter into a post-nup or a prenup? It's all just really fascinating to me. Well, the, fact, the interesting thing about prenups to me, and this is part of the conversation I have with a client, is that in many ways, prenups, I wouldn't say predate marriage, but they've all, they've, there's been pre, prenups dating back to <laughs> you know, in Jewish law, the ketubah uh -huh. goes back thousands of laws. And actually what is interesting, um, particularly in Jewish law and the ketubah, is the prenup was originally there to protect the woman, uh -huh. to provide for the woman uh, in case of divorce. Whereas now often we see um, prenups are, <laughs> you know, used as a tool to keep everything separate and make sure uh, the woman doesn't get a share of the community or doesn't get her share of spousal support. Um, and I think in the, the Catholic Church as well, there's the, uh, the, the pre cana process uh -huh. um, where uh, one has to go to the church and they have a uh, uh, education about marriage and, and, and prenuptial agreements and finances. So I think in all religions, yeah. um, there, is, there is a sort of prenuptial educational process. Right. Uh, if you like reading Jane Austen and like, you know, English novels, you uh -huh. see that, that marriage uh -huh. uh, was at least uh, in a certain class where there was property was primarily a financial arrangement yeah. before it was a romantic right. arrangement. Um, and I've, I, I've got to tell you, I've really enjoyed working with you and doing kind of prenups with you. Likewise. Um, it is interesting. It's an interesting question. If you could make all the rules, what would they be? You know, so that's what I think the question is with regard to prenuptial agreements. And I think that, and postnups, I think that um, traditionally, let's say the last 40 years, the, um, the prenup has been designed to prejudice uh, or to, to give more rights to the higher earner or the wealthier spouse. I had a prenup recently where um, there was the traditional situation where you had what we call a person, the have and the have not. And by the time they were done negotiating, because I had such a powerful have not, the, the husband said, this, this prenup is worse than if I, if I had no prenup. <laughs> <laughs> and they ended up having no prenup at all. Well, that's great. I mean, that's, that's a good outcome. I mean, but, the, uh, it's, it's, it, but you were mediating that one, right? Or were you one of the attorney representing the I was, the I was working not? with the wife in that case. Okay, so that, that speaks to your... Uh, success and efficacy as, as a lawyer. Um, well no. done. Well done. I mean, that's that's very true. Is that when you're getting into negotiating a prenup, it's a lot of it's about the power relationship and the that's balance right. of bargaining strength. And obviously, if you have a good attorney, 
uh, like yourself, that makes a, a, a big difference. And I've done prenups where I've had, uh, you know, uh, extremely wealthy, um, uh, we say the, the wealthiest spouse, and I'm representing the less wealthy, wealthy spouse. Uh -huh. And, um, but they, they've been, they've been very determined. They've uh, um, are very intelligent. They understand uh, what they're gaining and also what they're relinquishing. And yes. we've had situations where they've said, well, I'm going to walk away from the marriage if, 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 <laughs> if, if, if you ask me to sign this. Uh -huh. And I think the hardest situation is where um, you have an extremely wealthy spouse that presents the prenup sort of just before the marriage, almost yeah. like an ambush. And yeah. there's, there's not much you can do about that situation. And right. So um, I want to say thank you very much. This has been a, a sort of wonderful interview. And Lots thank you fun. for letting us know about your practice. Um, again, my name is Warren Scheele. I'm a family lawyer and a certified specialist in Los Angeles. Um, Heidi, uh, I'm gonna, my website is www.la-familylaw.com. Uh, my office number is 310-247-9913. Um, over to you, Heidi. Ah, my uh, website address is familylawsolutions.com. And you can reach me at 310-207-2500. Thank you, Heidi. Have a you, great Heidi. rest of the day. I'm going to 